Good evening, everyone. Welcome to A Word from the Lord. Glad you're with us. We're raring to go tonight. I want to go ahead and plug the tent meeting. I know Caleb mentioned it as he went off, but in case you didn't catch that, the tent meeting starts September. Uh, September. I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Uh, June 19th, that's Monday. That'll be a week from this coming Monday. And uh, it's in Brosville at uh, the flea market there right before you get to the light at Whispering Pines. <clears throat> so uh, the tent will be up. You'll be able to see it if you're going down 58, back and forth toward Danville. It'll be on the north side of the road. And I uh, want you to come out every night at 7 o'clock. No collections. We never take up any money. I want you to uh, feel free to investigate. That's why we don't pass the plate. We don't pass the plate, so you'll feel free to investigate. And if you have any questions, be glad to answer them. And uh, so we really hope that you will make plans to come out. Uh, we're uh, looking forward to seeing you, and we hope that you will uh, come out and study God's Word with us every night at 7 o'clock starting uh, June the 19th. And so we uh, hope to see you there. I want to give you our contact information, uh, word from the Lord at gmail.com. That's how you can reach me, 276-340-2653. <clears throat> we will be opening the phone lines uh, uh, in a little bit. So if you have a question, Bible question, call in. We hope that you will uh, do that. We'll be glad to hear from you. Tonight I want to start off with a question that Jesus asked in Luke 17, beginning at verse 11. Luke 17 Beginning at verse 11, the Bible says, And it came to pass, as he went to uh, Jerusalem, that he passed through the midst of Samaria and Galilee. And as he entered into a, a certain village, there he met ten, there met him ten, leper, ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he was... Uh, and when he saw them, he said unto them, Go, show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a vo loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks, and he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, Where Were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? Now, I want to use this as a springboard. Jesus has healed, he's cleansed ten lepers, and he asks, where are the nine? Where are the other nine? One came back, one, one of the cleansed came back and, and gave him thanks. <clears throat> and Jesus said, where are the nine? Well, I, wanna, I want to put that question to you because there are other things in the Bible that come in groups of nine. And I want to ask that same question concerning other things. For example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, I want you to notice these things. Here's what Paul says. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are differences of administration, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of administration, uh, excuse me, and there are diversities of operation, but it's the same God which worketh uh, all in all. Now, but the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with them. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit. Verse 10, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another interpretation of tongues. But all these work of that one and self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Now, when you're reading through this, you'll notice, if you count it, there were nine spiritual gifts, nine miraculous gifts that were given by the same Spirit. Now, that is, they, they function by the power of the Spirit. Same Spirit in all these different gifts. Now, I want to ask you a question. Where are these nine? And the reason I ask this is because today we have what we call modern-day faith healers. They believe in miracles. They think the miracles of the Bible are still active today. I believe in miracles. I believe they happen in the Bible. They're not happening today. And if they were, I wouldn't have to ask, 
Where are the nine? Where are these nine miraculous gifts that were given in the first century for the edifying and the building up of, of the church? <clears throat> where are they? If they're still present today, where are they? Now, when you ask someone about miracles, oftentimes they'll say, well, I've got to get the tongues, you know, and everybody starts jib-jabbing. Well, if one of them is present, if one of them is available today, if somebody has one of these gifts, let's just say, for instance, uh, speaking in tongues, if that one is available, what about the rest? If somebody has one, where are the other eight? So where are the nine? Where are these nine gifts? You know, if you're going to, if you're going to find these nine, it may be, it may be that you need to know what they are. Because oftentimes, I think when people are, are reading through this, the only one they really know what it is is, is is tongues, and then they don't really know what that is. And then maybe gifts of healing, and then there's the gift of miracles and interpretation. Interpretation, I'm going to say the gift of interpretation, the gift of tongues, and the gift of healings are about the, about the, the two or three that everybody knows, but they really don't know what they are. Because if they do, they would know you can't find them today. If you really knew what it was that you thought you had, you'd recognize that you really don't have it. So what are these nine? Where are they? If you're making a claim that miraculous gifts are still available today, it ought to be that you ought to be able to demonstrate it, find it, point to it, show it, uh, make it manifest that they are still today. That's what Paul said. Paul said that these nine uh, uh, gifts, that the Spirit, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with them. And to one is given the word of wisdom, the uh, knowledge of, of, uh, of the same spirit, word of knowledge, the same spirit, and so forth. So this is the manifestation. We want to see the manifestation. If something is manifest, friends, that means that it is clearly seen. Yeah, when you start looking for these nine, boy, it's, it's like looking for hen's teeth. When you start looking around, where are the nine? I'm looking high and low. I'm looking in all these uh, Holy Ghost tent revivals. I'm looking in the in the Pentecostal church. I'm looking in the Apostolic church. I'm looking in all these individuals that claim the Spirit. The lady called and said the the uh, the Baptist church there in in, uh, in here in Ridgeville was uh, filled with the Holy Ghost. Let me tell you, you folks in the Baptist church better be careful because you know you're becoming Pentecostals because you don't really know what to look for either. You're letting people tell you, sell you a bill of goods that the Holy Spirit is doing all these things and and it's not. So where are these nine? We need, to, we need to know what they look like so we can find them if they are even available today. Where are these nine? What I want to do <clears throat> is I want to go through, I want to go through these nine gifts of the Spirit, these nine miraculous gifts, nine supernatural uh, gifts that were done, that we know were done in the first century, and let's see if they're still happening today. What are they? So we can see if we can find them. But here's the thing. Instead of saying, where are the nine, how about this? Let's forget the nine. How about we just get one? How about we find just one of them? Because like I said, if we can find one of them, then the other, the other eight have to be around there somewhere. Right? If it exists, it, we're going to find it. If we can find one of them, <coughs> we'll find all, all nine of them. But let's learn what they are to see if we can find even just one of them. Where are the nine? Hey, where are the, where's the one? Let's start here. Let's start. Let's go back. 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 8, Paul said, For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom. Now, what is the word of wisdom? What is the word of wisdom? You know, wisdom is defined as knowledge applied to life. All right? Knowledge ap applied to uh, to living. So if you have knowledge and you apply it in the right way, that's wisdom. How do, you, how do you use the knowledge that you have? Well, the Bible talks about God's wisdom being revealed through His Word. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and we're going to start in about verse uh, 9 I guess we will. As it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard nor uh, neither enter into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for them that love him. Now we're talking about how God has prepared redemption, how God has prepared to reveal his will to man. 
Verse 10, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, for the Spirit searcheth all things, yet the deep things of God. Verse 11, For what man knoweth the things of man, save the Spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. Now, we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Now, here's, here's what we're looking for. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So Paul says, we, we're giving you the wisdom of God. So it's revealed through God's Word. It's revealed through God's Word. But here's the thing. The Word of Wisdom that Paul says was a gift of the Spirit, listen, it was a gift that some people had, but other people didn't. So it was, in part, if you will, it was part of the way that God's wisdom was being revealed. Remember this, friends, when you're reading through the Bible, and you're reading 1 Corinthians or Acts or Romans or Galatians, whatever, you need to realize that the entire New Testament wasn't written. I mean, when you're reading 1 Corinthians and you're putting yourself in the shoes of the Corinthians, the letter to the, the 1 Corinthians, the letter of 1 Corinthians, was not yet written until Paul wrote it. In other words, they didn't have it. They couldn't go back and say, well, here's 1 Corinthians. No, that was the first, the, when they read it for the first time, that's the first time anybody read it. So my point is, when you're reading through the New Testament, you need to realize, hey, this was, this was the first, one of the first times anybody had ever read this. So Paul is telling them, some people have the word of wisdom. So some people had the, the gift that could give some revealed will from the mind of God. The Holy Spirit was giving the word of wisdom. Now, if... If that is the case, if that's still today, then there should still be somebody somewhere that's giving us a little piece of God's wisdom that hasn't yet been revealed. All right? If, the, if God's wisdom is revealed through His Word, and Paul says that it was being revealed by the Spirit of God, then if someone has this gift today, they should still be giving words of wisdom that are... Now notice that are different are in addition to the Bible. Don't, don't quote me the Bible. Don't quote me Romans. And don't quote me uh, Galatians. And don't quote me uh, Revelations or James or Peter and say, well, here's, here's the word of wisdom and start quoting Scripture. No, if it's this, if it's the gift of the word of wisdom, it's going to be something that's going to be different than what's already revealed. Now, it has to be in harmony with it. Now, have you found anybody that's given you some divine revelation, some divine word of wisdom that we don't already have? If they're giving you something that we already have, we don't need it because we already have it. If they're giving you something new, we don't need it. Why? Because we have all things that pertain to life and godliness. We have all that we need for our edification and instruction <clears throat> that we may be perfect in righteousness. 2 Peter 3, 16 and 17, I'm paraphrasing that. But if, so if it's something that we already have, we don't need it because we already have it. If something that is new, we don't need it because we already have everything we need. All right? So what is it? Now, when Paul says this, notice, some people had it and some people didn't. Let's look at 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 28. Uh, God has set some in the church, first apostles, secondly a prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Now watch this. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak with tongues, do all interpret? So everybody has, uh, Paul saying, these individuals have some different, different pieces of the puzzle, you might say. So my point, friends, is this. If someone has the word of wisdom, then let's demonstrate it, manifest it. And the reason I say if they have it, that's good because then there'll be another piece. See, if you find, here's the thing, if you find a gift of the Spirit that's being manifest, you will find another one. You know why? Because God 
in his wisdom, provided a system of checks and balances with these miraculous gifts. Now stay with me. If someone come up and said, well, I have a word of wisdom, and he started uh, telling something, there would be someone else with a miraculous gift that could confirm or deny whether this man was actually telling the truth. Say they all work together. Remember, in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, in verse 37, what did Paul say? Paul said, if any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. If someone came up and said, I have a word of wisdom, and he starts giving you some, some, some revelation, or telling you some revelation for God, well, someone else over here with maybe a, a discerning of spirits or some other gift could, could verify, yes, this is from God, or no, it's not. So if you find one, hey, you're going to find two. But you know what I haven't found? I haven't found anybody. I haven't found anybody that has the spirit of the word of wisdom or a gift of the word of wisdom. One person, let's find one that has the word of wisdom that's giving us something that's something that is different from the Bible but yet in agreement with the Bible. Some inspired revelation, some word of wisdom. We find one, just one, that's all we need to find. Just one's all we need to find. I don't think we can find it, friends. You know why? Because everything that was revealed through the word of wisdom has been written down and confirmed, and this is all we need. Well, let's see if we can find another one. Let's see if we can find one of these others. To another, the word of knowledge. To another, the word of knowledge. Now, what are we talking about knowledge? You know, knowledge is teaching that appeals to the intellect or reasoning. Now, friends, I'm not trying to be mean here, but I'm going to tell you something. When I talk to individuals that claim to have these miraculous gifts, there's one thing, there's one thing that if they claim to have the word of knowledge, there's one thing that's lacking, and that is the teaching that appeals to the intellect or reasoning. Friends, when you talk to individuals that are insisting that these miraculous gifts are for the day, one thing usually goes out the window pretty quick, and that is the reasoning. That is the intellect, the appeal to the intellect. It's not there. Because <clears throat> the, the Pentecostal assemblies that I've been in are the, are the places where I've, I've seen where people are so-called so using these miraculous gifts or have, have access to them or where they're being supposedly manifest. The one thing that's lacking is any kind of reasoning ability. It's all hopped on emotional, emotionalism. There's very little reasoning at all. Now, this gift to another the word of knowledge. Now notice, someone else is going to have this. To another word of knowledge. This was inspired knowledge that was not previously revealed. Now, again, very much like the word of wisdom. If you've got a word of knowledge, if you've got a word of knowledge, you're revealing something that hasn't previously been revealed. Now, friends, listen to what Paul says. Paul says knowledge comes from the gospel. From the gospel. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 3. If our gospel be hid, it is hid from them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine in the darkness, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. The light of the knowledge of the glory of God comes through the gospel. Now, friends, if you find someone that's got the word of knowledge, they're going to be giving you something that's not already in the Bible. Now, what is it that we need? What is, what is it that's being given that's not already in the Bible? So you've got, you've got a word of knowledge, and then you've got someone over here that's got the word of wisdom that's going to tell us how to apply this knowledge, and yet they're going to give us something that's in addition to the Bible? Wouldn't that be adding to the Bible? 
Wouldn't that make Paul a liar? Wouldn't that make Peter a liar when they say that we have everything that we need? You see, that would make a, a known inspired man, Paul, Peter, and the other inspired writers, it would make them liars because they say that we have all we need and here comes Joe Schmo along and he says, well, I've got a, I've got a word of knowledge and, and uh, uh, my friend over here or my wife over here has got the word of wisdom. So we're giving you something more and above than the Bible. Friends, I'm leery. I'm leery. You said, well, James, you said if you had, if you could find one, you could find two. So what if you got two people? One claims to have a word of knowledge and one claims to have a word of, of wisdom and they're, and they're in agreement. You must, have found, you must have found these gifts, these lost gifts that you claim are gone. No. Remember, remember this. There's, some, there's still another checks and balances that, that come with these gifts. And that is a miracle. Something that is undeniable. You can come up and tell me a story all you want to. And you can say, well, this is from God. Here's what God told me to tell you. Here's what God told me to tell you. And you can give me a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom uh, by your own accounts all you want to. But you know what? There was something else that had accompanied these, and that was a demonstration. Now, I may be getting a little ahead of myself here, but notice this. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, in verse 4, Paul said, My speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, all right? It wasn't just in word only, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. So, someone comes up and says, well, I've got the word of wisdom, and my friend over here has got the word of knowledge, and we're in agreement. All right, one more thing you need. Now do something notable. Do something miraculous. Something that is... Is, is no doubt, surefire, guaranteed from the power of God. Just like Nicodemus said to Jesus. We know that our teacher come from God, for no man can do the thing, these miracles except God be with him. Do something that no one can do except God be with him. Then, then we might have found them. But until then, no, we hadn't found them, friends. These things are lost. And besides, these are things that most people, <clears throat> you know, they're not even looking for. They're not even interested in finding. So, so we haven't found this. We haven't found this. What about this? To another faith. Now notice, every time, every time Paul says to another, we're talking about to another person. So you, you're going to have different people that have these different gifts to another faith. Now friends, we have to find out, well, what is this faith? Now we all know faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. So we can't be talking about that faith, right? We can't be talking about that faith. That's personal faith. This faith that we're talking about is a miraculous gift. So this gift was given to another. Again, it was a gift that not everybody had. So if it's just personal faith, well, everybody was going to, is going to get that, right? Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So everybody can believe. So this this has to be something even more special, a different uh, kind of faith. So this is not a personal faith we're talking about here. This is a, a gift, a miraculous gift. We're talking about a gift that will exercise divine power, a gift of faith that can <clears throat> cause great things to happen. For example, I believe this is the kind of faith that Jesus is talking about when he says in Matthew 17 and verse 19, he says, then came the disciples to Jesus apart and said, Why could not we cast him out? And Jesus said unto them, Because of your unbelief. For verily I say unto you, If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say unto this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, <clears throat> and uh, it shall be removed, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. So we're talking about the faith, this, this gift of faith that can do great and powerful things. Now, Paul makes reference to this. If we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13, remember what he says? He says, Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity and become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal, and though I have the gift of prophecy 
and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith, you mean even, even though Paul has some belief here, he's supposed to do No. He says, and though I have all faith, so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. He's talking about the ability to say to a mountain, go yonder, and it goes. To a tree, go yonder, plug and uh, be planted in the ocean, and it can be. That's what we're talking about. So the gift of faith. Now, if someone has the gift of faith, friends, hey, boy, that would be something to find right there. Now, if you want to look for one, this one would be a good one to look for. Look for that person that has this gift of this miraculous faith that has a that's a uh, the the power to exercise this this divine uh, ability to move mountains and trees and you know I, I'm man can you imagine can you imagine what it would be like to see that demonstrated all right so faith the gift of faith. To, to perform something that no one else could do. Wow. Wow. Yeah, let's find that one. Have you seen it? I haven't seen it, friends. I'm around. I've heard that it's available today. And the reason I know that is because I hear people say speaking in tongues and interpretation is available today. Well, if one's available, they're all available. So I'm looking for this one. I'm looking for this one because it's pretty rare. I haven't heard anybody say, oh, I have, a, I have the gift of faith. Oh, really? Boy, you know what? You might get a job uh, with, the, with the highway department. They're going to build some new roads. You know, maybe you can sign on up here in, uh, in Reedsville. I guess, I guess they're still working on freeway drive over there, aren't they? Man, you could, get, you could say, hey, I can, I, can, I can clear this land for you. You know, we just put the road down right there. You want to build a road across the mountain? Move that mountain. Don't worry about digging a tunnel. We'll just move the mountain. See what we're talking about, friends? We're, we're talking about a powerful, powerful uh, ability here. Haven't seen it. Haven't seen it. To another, the gifts of healing. Well, now we're getting to something that a lot of people say, say they have. But listen to what Paul says. Let's read the context here again. 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 8. Uh, or verse 9. To another, faith by the same spirit to another the gifts of healing by the same spirit now friends listen again Paul said the gifts of healing this miraculous gift was the gifts of healing so it was many gifts if you will it was many gifts wrapped up in one ability. The Spirit would manifest in this gift by giving someone the gifts of healing. That is the ability to heal more than one kind of sickness. See? Now, when you read in the New Testament, friends, you don't read about specialists, you know? You don't read about specialists. Today we go to the doctor, well... You know, we're going to the knee doctor, the leg doctor. You know, we're going to the, the ear, nose, and throat specialist. You know, you got something wrong with your shoulder. Well, we need to send you to a, a, a specialist. You know, you need some work done on your teeth. We need to send you to a specialist. There, there were no specialists when it came to miracles and gifts of healing. All right? It, it was, if you had the gift of of healing, you could heal all manner of sicknesses, physical maladies. Notice this. In Matthew, Matthew 9, 27. Matthew 9, verse 27. When Jesus departed thence, two blind men followed him, crying and saying, Thou, son of David, have mercy on us. And when he was come unto the house, the blind man came to him, the blind men came to him, and Jesus said unto them, Believe ye that I am able to do this? They said unto him, Yea, Lord. Then touched he their uh, eyes, saying, According to your faith, be it unto you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus straightly charged them, saying, See no man, see that no man know it. So Jesus wasn't limited to just doing some kind of 
of uh, uh, healings. He could heal the blind. He could heal the blind. In uh, Luke 22, Luke 22, he put old Malchus's ear back on. One of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear. Then Jesus answered and said, Suffer ye thus far, and he touched his ear and healed him. Woo! Healed his eyes, his ear. Notice this in Matthew 12 and verse 10. Matthew 12 and verse 10. Uh, here comes a man with a withered hand. Behold, there was a man which had his hand withered, and he asked and said, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him? And they asked him, saying, Is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath day that they might accuse him? And he said unto them, What man uh, shall there be among you that have but one sheep, and if it fall into the pit on the Sabbath day, will not lay hold on it and lift it out? How much uh, then is a man better than a sheep? Wherefore it is, a law, it is lawful to do well on the Sabbath. Then saith he to the man, Stretch forth thine hand, and he stretched it forth, and it was restored whole like the other. Friends, I know some people that have, have uh, limbs that aren't whole. I know people that have eyesight and, they're, and they're, they're blind. If you could find someone that has the gifts of healing, it wouldn't be a problem for them to heal eyesight or withered hand or severed ear. But you know what I usually find? I usually find that these so-called gifts of healing today they're all inside jobs. You know that? They're all inside jobs. What do I mean by that? I mean they're on the inside. They're, they're down deep in the body where no one can see. Where, where no one can say, hey, you know, I know this man was crippled from, from birth. I know this man is blind. I know this man has lost a limb. Can you imagine, can you imagine all of the uh, um, uh, the power and all of the influence that could be gained if somebody had this gift and they just, you know, they just parked outside of uh, Walter Reed Hospital and all these, all these disabled vets come back, limbs gone, arms gone, legs gone. Man, I don't need to check into there. Let me just restore that. Let me preach to you and restore it. Boy, I mean, let me tell you, people just be believing left and right. You know what? They're not today. But today, when you have these gifts of healing, it's all on the inside. See? But when Jesus and the apostles, the first century uh, miracles being done, they didn't heal just inside. Now, they did some inside jobs. They healed issues of blood and things like that. Palsies, fever. But... Today, man, it's all inside jobs. Well, I got some... Uh, he healed the lady, had some arthritis. What? I know people that rub Ben Gay on their joints and they feel good for a while. Right? Well, uh, he healed somebody who had a brain tumor. Well, can we see that? Well, I, I healed somebody, you know, they had, they, had, they had a cancer or something in their... You know, down in their gut somewhere and laid hands on, boom, they're well. How do I know that? You know, let's demonstrate this. Let's demonstrate this. See, these are inside and outside miracles that Jesus did. Now, if, if we can find someone with this gift of gifts, if we can find someone that has the gifts of healing, all kinds of sicknesses should be healed. I remember when uh, uh, Johnny was debating uh, Deloa. Well, I don't remember his first name now. Uh, Deloa. One of, the, one of our brethren asked Mr. Deloa if he could uh, heal his hand. He had a problem with his hand. And he asked him if he could heal it. He said, well, I, I, I'm more of a, uh, I, I just primarily work on, you know, feet and legs. And uh, my other brother said, what he's trying to say is he's a leg man. That's, there are no specialists in the first century. If it was hands, if it was feet, if it was ears, 
Eyes, nose, and throat. They, they could heal it. Notice this. When in the first century, friends, gifts of healing could not be gainsaid. All right, you couldn't deny, you couldn't deny that this was a, a miracle. In Acts chapter 4 and verse 16, Acts chapter 4 and verse 16, they're saying, what shall we do with these, to these men? For that indeed a notable miracle hath been done by them is manifest to all them that dwell in Jerusalem and can and we cannot deny it. Friends, if someone comes up to me and says, well, I did a miracle, I performed a miracle. Now the law, the, let me take that back. They'll say, well, I didn't do it, God did it. Well, we know what you're talking about. God performed a miracle through you, all right? If a miracle was done by your hands through you, then I wouldn't be able to say that's not a miracle. But when someone tells me, yeah, I, I touched somebody and their, and their arm was healed and felt better, that's not a miracle. The fact that I'm saying no, I don't, I don't believe you. I don't believe that uh, a lady sitting on the porch had arthritis and you went over there and, and touched her and next day she's out working in the garden and nothing wrong with her. I, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. All right? So they gainsayed it. They said, they, they said we, can't, we can't deny it. Well, friends, if someone can deny that it was a miracle, it's not a miracle. It's not a miracle. As a matter of fact, look at this. In uh, Acts chapter 16 and verse 18. Now think about this. There was a, let's back up a little bit. Uh, verse 16. It came to pass as we, as we went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with a spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. And the same following Paul and us cried, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. And this did she many days. But Paul, being grieved, turned and said to the Spirit, I command thee to come in the name of Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out the same hour. And when her masters saw that the hope of their gains were gone, they caught Paul and Silas, drew them into the marketplace unto the rulers. Now, why would they be mad? Why didn't they go, they didn't really do a miracle. This, this, girl, this, this girl still got the spirit of divination. She's still going to make us money. No, they were mad about it. Because they saw... They saw that the means of their gain was gone. They couldn't deny that it was a miracle. Now, friends, gifts of healing just can't be denied. So if someone has this, it ought to be demonstrated very, very clearly. Now, have you seen this? I've seen a lot of people claiming it. I've seen a lot of people saying it. But I see a lot of people denying it as well. So let's see it demonstrated. Let's see it demonstrated. Have we found it? Have we found it? I haven't found that one. I haven't seen that one. So we need to, uh, maybe we need to move on, I guess. But we're looking for them, friends. See, we're looking for them. Because remember, we find one, we find them all. To another, the working of miracles. Now, you say, well, James, I thought all these were miracles. Well, they are. In the sense of they're miraculous and they're supernatural. But this, this working of miracles is something above and beyond just healing or uh, uh, speaking a word of wisdom or, excuse me, or a word of knowledge. This is something that is more of a power, maybe a, a, the sense of a, a miraculous uh, exercise of judgment, if you will. Uh, in Acts chapter 9, verse 36, Acts chapter 9 in verse 36. Let's look at this. And there was at, J at Joppa a certain disciple named Tabitha, which by interpretation is called Dorcas. This woman was full of good works and alms deeds, which she did. And it came to uh, pass in those days that she was sick and died, whom when they had washed, laid her in the upper chamber. And for as much as Lydia was nigh to Joppa and disciples had heard that Peter was, was there, they sent unto him two men, 
desiring him that he would not delay to come to them. And then Peter arose, went with them, and when he was come, brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him, weeping and showing the coats and garments which uh, she had made. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed, and turning him to the body, said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes, and when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up, and when he had called, the saints and widows presented her alive. Friends, this is what we're talking about. This is, you know, raising the dead is not just healing. Uh, raising the dead what ha happens when someone didn't get the healing. So, have you seen this? We're talking about raising the dead. Raising the dead. Well, wh why is it we don't ever see this, friends? Why is it we haven't seen this one? Somebody has to have this gift. I mean, if the Holy Spirit gives the, 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 the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretations to somebody, surely, you know, someone around here to another, see, we're talking about a different person, to another, the working miracle. Somebody has to do these working miracles. Or what about this in Acts 13 and verse 11? Acts 13 and verse 11, when you have uh, Paul <coughs> preaching the gospel and the... Uh, the uh, uh, you have um, uh, Elimaeus, the sorcerer, turning the deputy away from the faith. All right, Paul's preaching the deputy of the faith. He's, he's liking what he's hearing. He's preaching to obey the gospel. And, and Elimaeus, the sorcerer, uh, he's, he's trying to stop him. This is what Paul says, verse 9. Then Paul, who was also called Saul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O full of all subtlety, and on mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking someone to lead him by uh, the hand. Uh, to lead him by the hand. Why is no one doing this? You know, there's a lot of people gainsaying, trying to stop these so-called faith healers from spreading their doctrines, teaching their lies, but no one's ever blinded. No one's ever struck blind. <clears throat> and do you think, do you think, by the way, do you think that Paul uh, knew what it was like to be blind? I mean, he'd been struck blind for doing about the same thing, wasn't he? He was trying to prevent people from obeying the gospel. He was killing Christians, and the Lord struck him blind. So here's a man comes along. He's trying to stop someone from obeying the gospel. And Paul says, hey, let me show you what it's like. You know, you can be blind for a season. It's kind of scary. You know, maybe you'll, maybe you'll realize just who you're dealing with here. Friends, why is it that nobody, nobody has ever struck blind? I remember Brian Brown. I don't know where he is now. He's up there in Collinsville one time. <clears throat> he said that Johnny be blind. That was, I think that was back in, I don't know what that was, 2003, four. Man, it's been 14, 15 years or longer. See that? Why isn't anybody doing that? Why isn't anyone showing, manifesting this gift of this working of miracles? Power, signs, wonders. They all confirm the message and the messenger as being from God. That's what we're talking about here. So all these people that claim to have a word of wisdom, word of knowledge, or gifts of healing, and so forth, demonstrate it. And if someone comes along and says, no, that's not true, you don't have that, hey, blind them. Blind them. So we're, we're saying, where are the nine? But we're really saying, well, <clears throat> how about just one of these? How about just this one? Boy, this would be something. This would be something to see, be something to manifest. It was really there. Now look what Paul says. He says, to another prophecy. Now friends, this is a pretty interesting uh, gift here, the gift of prophecy. Prophecy was foretelling and forthtelling. Foretelling would be telling the future an event that's going to happen in the future, and forth was just giving a message, revealing it from God. 
But here's the thing. Prophecy was always to edify. It was always done to edifying. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 2. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him. Howbeit in the spirit he speaketh mysteries. Uh, verse 3. But he that prophesieth speaketh unto men to edification, to exhortation, and comfort. Now, again, now this is like any of these others. You got a word of faith, a word of wisdom, the gift of prophecy. These are all uh, messages that are being revealed. Now, they're going to have to be confirmed by a miracle in themselves. Remember the checks and balances. If you've got someone coming and say, well, I'm going to give you a prophecy, I'll give you a word of prophecy. Well, let's demonstrate to make sure that it's from God and you're not just telling us a tall tale. Let's give us, you know, give us a, a, a demonstration of the spirit and the power so that we uh, know that you're not just pulling our leg here. So it was always, it was always for edifying. Now, it might be something like telling the future of an event that's going to happen like in Acts chapter, uh, Acts chapter uh, 11. In verse 28, you have Agabus here. Uh, there stood up one of them named Agabus and signified by the Spirit that there should be a great dearth throughout all the world which came to pass in the days of Claudius Caesar. So, uh, you know, let's see someone give some details about that. Or like Agabus did in uh, Acts 21 where he said, you know, he took, he took the girdle and bound Paul's hand and said, whoever wears this girdle is going to be bound in Jerusalem. And that's what happened. Well, where's this gift of prophecy? I hear people saying, well, here's a prophecy. We're prophecy giving a prophecy. Well, friends, like these other miraculous gifts that came with a demonstration and power, you know what else it would do? It could convince the unbeliever. Do you find it interesting that God, through the Spirit, gave these gifts and they all were uh, done in such a manner that they couldn't be gainsaid. If they were confirmed, they couldn't be gainsaid. Notice this, in 1 Corinthians 14, 24, and if all prophecy and there came in, if, if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not or one that unlearned, he is convinced of all and is judged of all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, and so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Now friends, when someone has a gift of prophecy, I suspect I'd like to see someone tell all the secrets of your heart. You know, take someone to all the secrets of the heart and let them be manifest. An unlearned, unlearned or unbeliever. I remember going to... Uh, a uh, place where we're, uh, oh, Bill Daniels, Prophet Bill Daniels. You know, he said I had a broken heart. What? Wh what was that? You know, I got home, made sure my wife was still there. You know, made sure she didn't run off left me or something. No, I, I don't have a broken heart. Told another fellow, he said, got, got, well, you got a thyroid problem. The brother said, no, I'm just fat. See? Wh what are we talking about here? Tell all the secrets of your heart. The prophecy is going to cause individuals to believe and say, uh, God is in you of the truth. Let me tell you, the people that I've seen prophesying claiming to have prophecies, I don't say God is in them of the truth. I say, man, they got, they got a spirit in them, but it ain't the Holy Spirit. See, they have to be, they have to be confirmed in some way. So the gift of prophecy, can we see one of these? Can we see one of these? Can we find this gift? To another discerning of spirits. Listen, if what is being taught is being taught by God, then it ought to be easily discerned. If someone comes in and they're telling a lie, then someone with a discerning of spirits would know that. John tells us in 1 John 4 and verse 1, Try the spirits to see whether they are of God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. 
So we can, dis- we, can, we can try the spirits and discern whether they're telling us something from God or not. But this involves the ability to know the heart. Like in Acts 5, Peter knew Ananias and Sapphira lied to God. He told them the secrets of their heart. He said, you, you lied. You kept this in your heart. Go and read it. So someone having this gift, you know, they wouldn't teach something that was contrary to the Word of God. They wouldn't teach something that was false because they could discern, they could discern what was truth or they wouldn't allow someone to come in teaching a false doctrine because they could discern whether it's true or not. And they themselves certainly wouldn't teach a lie. So, discerning of spirits. You know, of all the gifts, man, th- this is the one that seemed to be most, would be most beneficial today. Someone coming to your assembly and you know right away, you know, what, what was in their heart. Now, we go to assemblies and we're told all the time, oh, you just here to stir up trouble. No, we're here to ask questions. Y'all just, you know, pe- people always uh, attribute motives to us. But they don't know our hearts. They don't know our hearts. You're, you're, just, you're just guessing. If you really want to show them what's in our hearts, tell us the secrets of our heart. Tell us the secrets of our heart, see? And discern and discern whether something's being taught is true or not. I find it very interesting that we have the Bible, we have the Bible, and we can discern, we can discern better than the so-called inspired people. Think about that for a minute, friends. The uninspired, the uninspired individuals have, have the ability, have the ability to discern what is true and what is not, and the inspired people, they're wrong. See, I can go and take my Bible and I can listen to somebody and I can, I can discern whether you're telling me the truth or not because I have the, confer- the confirmed word right here. All right? It's like the people in, Acts, in, in Revelation chapter 2. They tried them that said they're apostles or not and found them to be liars. So anything that's contrary to the Bible would be from an evil Spirit, all right? So, can you discern it? Why is it that people who claim to have discerning of spirits, they themselves are teaching false doctrine, you know? Well, we got a discerning spirit. Who said that? My wife. Wait, wait a minute. Okay? See, you're saying, you're saying the truth based upon something that God says is wrong. Well, I'm not going to believe you're discerning of spirit. To another diverse kind of tongues, this is the one that everybody likes, right? Friends, languages are what we're talking about here. We're talking about languages that are not learned. Now, can we find this gift? Can we really and truly find this gift, friends? Do we have to go through this in Acts 2, verses 5 through 8? They were heard, they heard speaking in their own tongues, their languages, their dialects is really is what the word is. And notice this, in 1 Corinthians 12, 28, I'm trying to rush through this because we got a uh, uh, running out of time here. God has sent some of the church, uh, first apostles, second uh, prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, diverse healings help diversity of tongues. Now, think with me on this, friends. Have you found someone that claims they can speak in tongues? diversity of tongues. That means they can speak in different languages. Unlearned. Never learned it. They're just speaking a language that they've never studied. But you know, when I, when I hear all these tongues that are supposed to be taught, they, they all kind of sound the same. Don't they? Now, you know, if I've heard people speak in French, and I've heard people speak in Spanish, and I've heard people speak in German and some other languages, and I may not know what they're saying, but I can guess what language they're speaking, a lot of them, because they sound different. They sound different. But when I hear someone speak in tongues today, so-called, with this so-called gift of kind, diverse kinds of tongues, 
it all sounds sounds the same, right? Need a tie, buy a tie, should have bought a Honda, whatever. I mean, that's what it all sounds like to me. You know, I just... That's, really? Well, what language was that? Oh, that was French. Well, can you say something in uh, Japanese? That sounds just like French. Well, you know, it's all from the same spirit. Got the same accent. No, friends. Different languages are going to sound differently. So when someone says, I have a gift of tongues, they're speaking a different language. They're supposed to. I haven't found this. I haven't found it. Still looking. To another, the interpretation of tongues. Friends, think about this. If there is the ability to translate these languages, we would be in good, good shape, wouldn't we? Remember, these, the languages were given and the interpretation was given to edify. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 5, 14, 27, 28. We read these before. Let all things be done edifying. Now, if someone doesn't give an interpretation of the language, it's not edifying. If you do some jib-jabbing, there's not any edifying done there. So we need to know if someone says this, what language is it and what's the translation? And we need someone else to confirm it. All right? Now, if this gift was really available today, friends, man, we would have a flawless translation. We wouldn't have to worry about uh, taking something from the Greek and then translating into the English and then you know, trying to get the words just right. Now, King James is reliable, very reliable. It, it's, it's, I would say, the most reliable translation today. But we wouldn't need the ESV, the NIV, the STP, the HIV, or the QVC, whatever. We wouldn't need any of those, those different so-called translations that are often perverted. If we had someone who had the gift of interpretation of tongues, they could just read out the Greek New Testament or the Hebrew Bible, or Old Testament, and, man, we'd have it set. So where are these nine? Who has them? Who has them? Who can demonstrate them? Can't find them, friends. So instead of just finding nine of them, how about one? Friends, we don't need them because we have the Bible. I'm out of time. I'm going to get my content information up here right quick. Friends, I want you to come out to the tent starting June the 19th in Brosville. Hope to see you there. If we can assist you in any way, we want to do that very thing. We'll give you a word from the Lord. Have a good night.